In this video, we're going to continue our discussion of cellular respiration. So this will be part two. Again, we're on IB 3.7 and 8.1. And really, in this video, we're going to focus on the steps that occur within the mitochondria. So in the last video, we talked about glycolysis and uh, how glycolysis produces pyruvate. We're going to look now at how that pyruvate is used and walk through the steps of the Krebs cycle and the electron transport chain. Um, so to, to kind of do a recap of the overall process that we're looking at here, Glycolysis happens in the cytoplasm, and this process requires uh, a little bit of energy, requires 2 ATP in order to occur, but it produces our net production is, is 2 ATP. Um, we also get some uh, electron uh, pro um, carrying molecules in NADH, um, and we're creating this three carbon molecule called py pyruvate that's going to be used and necessary in the Krebs cycle. Um, which is then producing products that will be used in the electron transport chain. And this is really where we're going to see the majority of our ATP produces in that electron transport chain uh, mechanism that we'll look in this video. I've linked this image on my website as well if you'd like to go back and take a look at this a little bit bigger so you can see all of the steps that are happening. Now, there's two different types of respiration that occur. Um, there's anaerobic respiration or aerobic respiration. In anaerobic respiration, uh, it's the process occurring without oxygen. So there's no oxygen present. Um, this can occur in some sort of prokaryotic organisms that live in environments without oxygen, um, organisms that live near sulfur vents uh, on the ocean's floor uh, would be a good example. They are able to create energy um, without, uh, without the presence of oxygen. Um, in this case, pyruvate stays in the cytoplasm, so it doesn't, there's no mechanism that goes into the, the mitochondria. It stays within the cytoplasm. Obviously, prokaryotes don't have mitochondria. Uh, in humans, uh, this can occur sometimes if there's an absence of oxygen. Uh, a good example would be like if there's very strenuous exercise uh, and there's not enough oxygen available. It's not being passed through the blood uh, from the lungs to the different muscle groups. If there's an absence of oxygen, uh, the pyruvate can be converted into lactate acid. Uh, in yeast, which is actually very helpful, uh, pyruvate can be converted into CO2 uh, and alcohol. Uh, there's no ATP that's produced, but um, this is one of the ways, and, and this is how uh, bakers use yeast to produce bread. Uh, for many centuries, uh, humans have used yeast to produce beer and wine, and so actually this process is very helpful. Uh, for a while, for a good deal of time, um, we thought that in humans, uh, lactate acid, uh, which is produced when there's no oxygen present, was the cause or the reason for having sore muscles or developing soreness in the muscles. Uh, but there's newer research that suggests maybe that's not necessarily the case, so we're not exactly sure. But there is a buildup of lactate acid um, when oxygen is not present. And so that's anaerobic respiration. Those are the, the main key things that you, you know, need to know for anaerobic respiration. Most of our fo focus is going to be on aerobic respiration, and this is respir respiration that occurs with oxygen. So we're looking at how oxygen is used um, for the cell to respirate and really create ATP. Uh, the pyruvate is going to be moved into the mitochondria, so different than anaerobic respiration. Um, we're actually going to break down that pyruvate, and it's going to release some hydrogen ions, which is going to result in carbon dioxide, water, and a large yield of ATP that we're going to produce. So some steps of aerobic respiration. We have the link reaction, which we'll look at in just a second, the Krebs cycle, uh, or the citric acid, ci acid cycle, excuse me, and the electron transport chain. Those are the three portions uh, of this process that we're going to look at in more detail in this video. So let's start with the link reaction. Uh, this process is basically the oxidation of pyruvate within the matrix of the mitochondria. So we're within the matrix uh, of the mitochondria, and this is changing that pyruvate um, uh, a little bit. We're, we're essentially uh, going to remove some, some different parts from, uh, from pyruvate. Um, coenzyme A uh, is an enzyme and it's going to remove the pyruvate's carboxyl group. So we're going to remove that, that carboxyl group is going to be removed and it's going to be released as CO2. So during this whole process, CO2 is one of the products, one of the things that's released from this. Um, coenzyme A also removes electrons as in hy hydrogen ions, and it's going to transfer them to NAD plus to form NADH. NADH is a very uh, reactive molecule, and it's going to be used during the electron transport chain um, to help power, basically, a, a pump that's going to produce ATP. So that NADH is going to be very necessary and useful later on in this process, as we'll see also we produce some in the Krebs cycle. 
Um, the coenzyme A actually attaches to the molecule that was pyruvate to form acetyl-CoA. And acetyl-CoA is what's going to inter, uh, enter the Krebs cycle and what's actually going to be used in that, in that cycle, the molecule that's, that's shuffled through that cycle uh, or the citric acid cycle. So here's kind of a nice summary diagram that walks through what's happening here. We start from glycolysis, we start with pyruvate, uh, we add coenzyme A plus NAD uh, plus, and that gives us acetyl-CoA, which is the molecule that's going to go to the Krebs cycle. Uh, CO2 is a waste product where it's released, and we have reduced NAD, which is NADH, and this is going to be oxidative phosphorylation. That's the portion of the electron transport chain. Those, those phosphates are going to be oxidated. And we'll get to that portion in a minute. So now what we're going to look at is, is taking that acetyl-CoA and how it enters the Krebs cycle. Uh, the Krebs cycle can be a little complex. It's, there's a lot of steps to it. Um, you're not going to need to memorize every step and every change to the, the molecules as it progresses. Uh, but we are going to kind of look at some of the main things and, and kind of simplify the steps a little bit and also look at the products, uh, the inputs and the outputs, the products and the reactants. So here is an image uh, showing us the Krebs cycle. Uh, it's pretty complex, um, and I know I realize that it's, it's probably a little difficult to see in the video here. I've also linked this one on my website, so if you want to go back and you can, and you can take a look at this a little bit more closely. Um, essentially what's happening here is we start with uh, acetyl-CoA. That's going to start our, our, our process here. And it's, um, it's joined or it's bonded, it's connected to a molecule called oxalous acetate. Uh, it's a four carbon molecule and, and this molecule right here um, is converted uh, to isocitrate. Uh, it's an isomer, isomer of citrate and that's the first kind of molecule that goes through this process. And so we're going to see this molecule go through this cycle and it changes a number of times. Um, there are different names for each of these different molecules. You're not going to have to be required to know those. Um, as, you, as we get through this, uh, the, the things are going to be added, things are going to be removed, um, and that's kind of what we're focusing on. Um, so really what happens uh, is in that isocitrate, um, it's oxidized, and it's going to reduce NAD plus to NADH. And so that is right here, we're, we're getting some NADH produced by changing uh, the oxidative state of these different molecules. Um, at this step in the cycle, we actually get one ATP produced. Uh, we get one ATP produced. Um, this molecule's lost CO2 uh, by this point. Um, and as the process continues, we're going to produce uh, two more NADH molecules and an FADH2 molecule, which is also similar to NADH and is, is very highly reactive. At the end of the overall cycle, uh, we start with a four carbon molecule um, that is oxal acetate, um, and, and that's what starts our process and starts uh, connects with um, the the pyruvate that starts that enters the whole process. Uh, excuse me, the acetyl CoA that starts the whole process, and so this this molecule is basically recycled and it's reused throughout the whole process. So let's take a look at the steps here so that you can see this a little bit better. Um, we start with acetyl-CoA, and it's joined to a four-carbon molecule called oxalacetate. Citrate is produced and converted to isocitrate. It's an isomer. It's, a, it's the same molecular numbers, but it's a different structural arrangement. The isocitrate is oxidized, uh, meaning that it gives off uh, hydrogen, uh, and it reduces. Uh, the NAD plus takes that, that hydrogen ion, so it becomes NADH. Um, and also the isocitrate loses CO2. The carbon molecule, uh, the, the formerly isocitrate, the carbon molecule is phosphorylated, meaning that a phosphate is added and uh, ATP is produced from this or during this process. Oxidation occurs two more times during the cycle, and so we produce, uh, the process produces uh, NADH um, and FADH2. Uh, these are both, again, highly reactive molecules that are going to be used in the electron transport chain. And as I said, at the end, the four carbon molecule produced at the end of the cycle is uh, oxalacetate and it's recycled. So it's reused at the beginning. Uh, what's produced at the end is reused at the beginning in order to restart this whole cycle and, and the process can continue. A nice summary of, of what we're seeing happen here. Um, in overall, or in general, uh, carbon dioxide is removed in two reactions, so we get a waste of CO2. 
Uh, hydrogen is re removed in four different reactions during the cycle. NAD plus accepts hydrogen in three, three reactions to make three NADH. And FADH, uh, excuse me, FAD accepts hydrogen in one reaction to make FADH2. And during this whole process, we get one uh, ATP molecule. Uh, and so those are the big things that we're producing. This NADH and this FADH2 uh, are really the, the primary purposes of, of the Krebs cycle in order to produce these molecules that are going to be highly reactive and used in the electron transport chain. Yes, producing one ATP is helpful, and that's all our ultimate goal through this whole process, but it's a very small portion of the overall uh, product that we're going to see. So now let's get into the electron transport chain. Um, the Krebs cycle produces these NADH and FADH2 molecules, and they carry high-energy electrons. Um, within the inner membrane, uh, there's a chain of three electron carriers, three proteins. So this is within the inner membrane of the mitochondria. And, and those three uh, enzymes, uh, those three proteins, are going to release electrons in the form of hydrogen ions from NADH and FADH2. So those two molecules, NADH and FADH2, are going to release their hydrogen ions. This process uh, releases H2O into the matrix of the mitochondria and hydrogen ions uh, into the inner membrane space. The hydrogen ions, by moving across the membrane uh, with the concentration gradient basically provides energy necessary for ATP synthase to couple or conjoin phosphates to AT ADP to create ATP. Um, with oxygen present, it provides a binding site for hydrogen ions. So this seems like a lot, and this is, is kind of confusing, and I think an image is, is very helpful in explaining this. And so let's walk through this process again uh, using an image. Um, here's our inner membrane right here. We've got our inner membrane, and here are these proteins that are going to release the FADH and the NADH and, and, and move these hydrogen ions. Here's the matrix of our mitochondria, this is the white portion, and here's the inner membrane space. And so what we see happen is NADH uh, enters at the first protein in this sequence, FADH2 enters in the second, and they're releasing their hydrogen uh, ions. And so the hydrogen goes into this inner membrane space. Um, the electrons uh, travel through the electrons travel through uh, these proteins, and, and what happens here is we're creating a, uh, an area of very high concentration. The intermembrane space is, is very small, uh, and so what, what this does is it creates a very small, uh, in this small area it creates a very high concentration of hydrogen ions, and as we discussed in, in our transport unit, through diffusion, these molecules want to move from an area of high concentration to low concentration. So they're going to cross back into this, into the matrix here. They're going to cross the inner membrane. And when they do so, they're transferred through this molecule called uh, ATP synthase. And so when crossing through the, the inner membrane here, um, the hydrogen ions are basically forcing this ATP synthase to, to, to turn. Um, it's kind of like a, a rotor and the, the hydrogen ions, by moving through it, cause it to turn. And in doing so, this ATP synthase is coupling or, or connecting a phosphate to ADP, adenosine diphosphate. It's adding a phosphate to that in order to create ATP. And so that is the end result, is, is the primary purpose of all of this is to provide um, essentially the, the energy um, to create ATP. And we're doing this by releasing these hydrogen ions into the inner membrane space. They move back into the matrix, and ATP, ATP synthesis move, uh, uses that movement movement to couple ADP with ATP, and so we're producing ATP as an end result. In our last portion of, of cellular respiration in part three, we'll take a look at um, a little bit more closely the different parts of the um, mitochondria and specifically um, outline their, their different portions a little bit, um, and we'll also talk about um, this, this process in a little bit more detail. Um, the movement of these hydrogen ions across the membrane to, to connect ADP with a phosphate to make ATP. So we'll focus on those, those couple things in the last portion of the video.